Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to this episode of the Dharma Junkie podcast. It's uh, Justin. It's good to be with all of you again. It's been kind of sporadic that I've been putting episodes out, but uh, I really am trying to get back to that more frequently. Um, I've had a lot of stuff going on in my life, and I've been reorganizing and rearranging some things is to have more time to do the things that mean the most to me. And this podcast is one of those things. Um, so with that, on this episode, my guest is author, humanitarian, and all around good dude, and my friend, Chris Grosso. And we talk about uh, his spiritual path. We talk about relapse and recovery. We talk about a lot of stuff, man. I think you'll really, really enjoy this episode. So check it out. And without further ado, Chris Grosso. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of you might catch yourself sliding in and out of a Just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, your and mind and your brain. We're using digital, We're using techniques, digital techniques to overload, to overload and scramble, and scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, Chaos is beautiful. Chris Grosso, what's up, dude? My man, I'm psyched to connect. I know we've been trying to get this together for a minute. So, <laughs> thank you, brother. How are you? Oh man, I, I'm doing okay, man. You know, uh, just hanging in there, getting ready for the uh, the holidays and stuff. How about yourself? Same, man. Same. It's uh, I'm, as we we're just talking, work mode right now. Super busy with that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's stuff. I love what I do. It's super difficult. It's new for me, and I'm juggling working on a new book. And uh, just had a book come out. It's crazy right now, but that's life, you know. So you're, you're quite the uh, prolific author these days, huh? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> that's bad. I wouldn't use those words, but hey, man, that's nice. Thank you. You put out a hundred percent more books than I have. We'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. So, so what are you what are you doing for work these days? Yeah. So, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been self-supporting by writing and public speaking, which is great. But then I moved to California and whoa, California is crazy <laughs> expensive. Also, when COVID hit, you know, there was no public speaking and that's that was a, a considerable part of my income. So, you know, I came out here and uh, realized, oh, I'm going to have to actually start like working again if I'm going to make it out here. <laughs> so. Yeah, I um I found this job. Uh it's a it's actually really cool, man. It's it's at what was originally a nursing home, but then they created this unit. It's two it's called station one, station two. I'm on station two. And um it's for memory care. It's residents who have schizophrenia, who have Alzheimer's and dementia, bipolar. Um, so it's a it's a real hybrid of different diagnoses. Um I I I've never heard of a unit like this before. My supervisor, whose vision it was, um, said, as far as she knows, something like this doesn't exist. So it's it's an honor to be a part of it because, you know, having to go back to work to make a living, I, I want to work with human beings, you know? Yeah. That said, this is a crazy stressful job, you know? Like I was telling you as well before we started recording, mm. like half hour before I left, a resident who's a big guy, and I get along with him well, like I'm kind of his homie, um, he used to be in the crypts, and, uh, but he has schizophrenia, and he was having an episode, and he's like, dude, I'm going to crack you in your fucking mask, like when I, but, you know, I, I calmed him down, I de-escalated, and that's, that's what I do, man. It's like, I literally, unfortunately, watch people die, like in front of my eyes, that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see the horrors of like, what happens to the human body, the sounds on the unit are, are terrifying, the screams that you know, it's, it's very draining, but it's a lot of life lessons. And there's also poignant moments too. like, there are some residents where when they're lucid for a little while, I get to see them like again, and it's, you know, it's, it's lovely to meet them i i'm working with a guy right now who is wheelchair bound and and it doesn't have a lot of time left but i found out he used to grow vegetables and feed homeless people oh. um, 
yeah, like, you know, I'm working with a resident. She's a few years younger than me. Um, and on a way different note, not to be a bummer, dude, she was gang raped and stabbed and ended up jumping off a bridge into a street and Jeez. lit barely. Yeah. But so that's what, I, that's what I'm doing these days <laughs> is immersed in that while trying to work on my next book and take care of myself. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's heavy, man. That's a, yeah. it's definitely some heavy shit for sure. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's quite, yeah, quite I, a, if nothing else, I will always come transparent and, and give you the raw, honest <laughs> truth, brother. <laughs> right. Yeah. Same, same. Uh, some people uh, appreciate that. Some don't. <laughs> yeah. It, and Hey, I'm not for everybody. So it is what it is. You know, <laughs> yeah. Never have been, never will be. Right. No, I feel that. Yeah. That's quite a, quite a uh, jump from public speaking. Yeah. And you know, um, it's not that I don't hope to still do that. You know, with, with this next book, I just was talking with my literary agent on Monday. I've been with her for over 10 years. She's amazing. She's like my second mom. <laughs> she represents a stable of just phenomenal authors who are way more successful than I am, but um, she's amazing. And we're talking about this new book and um, I'm not really able to talk about it yet because we're still honing right. it in, but she's like, yeah, this is your book. This is the one. So you know what I'm doing right now? I don't think it's sustainable for really any human being. Um, it's just too much on every level. But again, I'm learning a lot about myself, about life, about human beings, about living in the moment, about dying. Um, and as my teacher Ramdas would say, this is all grist for the mill. So, you know, I'm, I do my best to find gratitude each day for what I'm doing and and the lessons and just bring my heart and compassion into that. And, and not just to work and, and everywhere, man, that's just, that's just how I've tried to live for a long time now is yeah. be cool and don't be a jerk. But, you know, right. it's, <laughs> if, you know, if everybody could just do that, right. It, what a different world it would be. Man, yeah. I'll tell you what, it would be yeah. A, yeah, just a much, much kinder and gentler place for sure. Yeah. I remember, I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen and Andrea Levine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love their work. And um, I'd had, I interviewed them a long time ago and I forgot how it came up, but um, it was either Stephen or Andrea or together. They were like, could you imagine if in every school across the world, around third grade, we taught a compassion class, what a different world this would be. And it's like, why don't we do that? Right. You know, like, yeah, we teach math and we teach all, you know, whatever science and, and stuff that's important and it's in its respectful regard. But like, where is that going to get you if you look at where we're at now and and we're on the brink of just like chaos and and just heartbreaking, scary stuff, you know? Yeah, man, dude, I, you're you're speaking my exact language right now. I tell people all the time, I'm like, you know, they send ten kids to school and they teach them math and science and they teach them history and they teach them all this shit. It's like, why don't we have a class on like coping skills? Like, right. hey, life's going to be hard sometimes. And here's some techniques that can help you deal with that in a healthy manner. Right. Yeah, exactly. you know, it, it just makes sense to me. And I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only person uh, saying no, that. Yeah. not at all, man. And that's the thing, you know, like it, it's I'm seeing, you know, that things like that are being introduced now. And especially like I've worked a lot uh, in treatment centers, you know, and spoken in treatment centers. And when I went through my own stuff with addiction, like it wasn't like that. It was like, don't pick up, go to meetings, get a sponsor, you know, AANA. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I don't judge anyone and and I still do my 12 step stuff, but there's other ways too. Let's look at the whole being, the holistic process. And so I am seeing more like yoga and Reiki and equine therapy and aromatherapy and nature um, meditation. Like that's so important. Better late than never, just hoping it's not too late you know, for people and collectively. Yeah. So, man, how did you get hooked up with Ram Dass? Uh, whew. So it was back in, I was in school for addiction counseling back in like 2004 ish, let's say. And uh, my professor who is also my academic advisor, another really influential woman in my life. I had no interest in spirituality. Um, I was very punk rock, like atheist, like spirituality religions a crutch like i was ignorant and i own it you know like i didn't know the difference between spirituality and religion i remember i went into her office one day we were going to schedule classes for the next semester and i was waiting for her and i saw like on her cork board like kali ganesh jesus mary and i'm like and she came in i'm like what's going on there like i thought you just pick one and go with it and she kind of <laughs> laughed and she's like where'd you hear that so anyways 
we talked about it a little bit and I, I had another class with her in a couple of days and she's like, Hey, you know, um, if I bring you a book, would you read it? And at this point I was not much of a reader, but I trusted her and I was like, yeah, sure. So she brought me in Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. Mm, and this yeah. was before like he was on Oprah before he blew up. And I only mentioned that because honestly, had he been the status he is now, I, my punk rock, like ignorant self would have, and I'm not saying all punk rockers are, <laughs> I love punk rock. I still listen to it, but my ignorant ass, uh, I would have been like, nah, that's commercial. I don't want to read it or I don't, you know, I'm not interested, but I did read it and my little apartment in Middletown, Connecticut. And I will never forget by the time I got through the introduction, it absolutely like flipped my world upside down. And I read that book cover to cover three times um, sequentially. And I'm so glad that I did. Mm. And I share that to get back to the Ram Das thing, because just a few blocks over, I would skateboard to the local library. Um, I made it my new home and they had a really great philosophy section, um, Eastern philosophy, neuroscience. And I just started engulfing myself in these different teachings, whether it was Thomas Merton and Gnostic Christianity, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche from Buddhism, Thich Nhat Hanh, right. Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, whatever, like A Course in Miracles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ken Wilbur, I just started like getting, I, I was hooked, you know, um, and I'll never forget taking out Be Here Now. And that was the second iconic book of my life. You know, it was like, holy shit, like, whoa. So um, from there, I devoured everything that Ram Dass had published up to that date. Mm -hmm. And um, fast forward several years later, probably about 10 years later, uh, I had a friend who had a website. I don't think it's a thing anymore, but it's called Where's My Guru? And um, I told her I was going to do some guest podcasting and interviews for her. And Ram Das had Polishing the Mirror coming out. Mm -hmm. And I had already interviewed for my website his co-author, Meshwar Das, a really beautiful guy. Um, but I figured, hey, maybe I can get Ram Das. And uh, unfortunately, I did. Um, Raghu Marcus, who is the director of the Love Surf Remember Foundation, got back to me and was like, yeah, Ram Dass will do the podcast. And I remember I, I was like, holy shit, like I don't get starstruck. I'd been interviewing <laughs> bands and actors and directors, super famous people in person over the phone on video for years. And I still get to. And that's really fun. But it was like to me, it was like Ram Dass, like Whoa. Right. And <laughs> And so I pod, I did this podcast with them. I was married at the time. I remember my now ex-wife, a, a beautiful woman, really good, good human being. She was there with me in the background, kind of off to the side. Uh, and I knew she was a big fan of his. And so I, after we were done, I introduced her to him. And we were just kind of talking as human beings. And this was before my first book came out. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking... I really wanted to ask him to write a blurb or an endorsement for it, <laughs> but I, he had just had a stroke not that long ago. I had yeah. seen first grace and I wanted to be respectful. Now I hadn't really announced the book was coming out yet. I didn't mention it to Raghu or anyone at love serve. Remember there was no way Ram Dass knew that I had a book coming out. You know, it wasn't major news. Hmm. And uh, I just, I mentioned that because I remember like the during the interview, should I ask him? Shouldn't I? And I, I decided on no, like respect this guy. He's busy. Right. He's older. So while we're talking and this is on YouTube, it's on my channel, you know, um, he goes kind of out of nowhere. He goes, and you have a book coming out. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, well, I want to offer it my Ashabad, which is blessing in Hindu. That's what Maharaji offered him for be here now. Hmm. I was like, whoa. And he goes, and yeah, if you want to, uh, you want to send it over, uh, I'll write a blurb for it. And I was like, I started to tear <laughs> up. And then this is the kicker. And then he sees me tearing up and he goes like this. He goes, and that came through from the boss, Maharaji. And, you know, I'd read in Be Here Now stories of Maharaji's magic. And I had read about that also, uh, Miracle of Love is a great book, kind of hard to find, but it's about Maharaji. And miracles he's worked in a lot of his devotees lives and i'm a bit of a skeptical person a little jaded by nature um but i do have an open mind when i read some of this stuff even from ram das you know like with some of these stories i'm like ah oh, probably but i don't know dude <laughs> and then that happened and then some other things have happened i won't go into detail but it's like huh that's crazy so anyways we stayed in touch and um, they were starting the Be Here Now podcast network shortly thereafter. And Raghu emailed me 
and said, you know, have you ever thought of doing a podcast, you know, of your own? And I was like, no, not really. And he, he's like, it's not that difficult. He told me how to do it. Um, I got some equipment, which is in storage right now. I, I'm sh- like shuddering that I don't have a microphone for you. I'm <laughs> you, I don't have headphones. I would never do this, but I don't <laughs> have them there. I'll have them in a few weeks. But um, but so I started a podcast based on the name of the website I had done, which is no more, unfortunately, but I called it the Indie Spiritualist. And uh, that's the name of my first book. Um, and that was my website, but that's the name of the podcast. And I was one of the original nine people. And it was surreal. It was Ram Das, Krishna Das, Sharon Salzberg, Joseph Goldstein, Raghu, myself, Jack Cornfield, Lama Surya Das. Um, somebody else is in there that I'm forgetting. Uh, but it was just like, whoa. I remember when they sent me the like images for it that they were going to be promoting. Like there's... There I am amongst my teachers. And I have this really sweet picture. Fast forward like another year, I got to go out to Maui and meet him, you know? And there's this really lovely picture of me with him and Sharon and Jack and Mirabai. And and somebody made a a point I didn't notice this at first. We it was Lion's Roar, the Buddhist magazine. Uh It was the 25th anniversary. And I was at the side of the stage and Mirabai Bush invited me up and said, Chris, we're going to live stream with them. Come say hi to them. You know? And I was like, me, really? She's like, yeah, get up here. And so she kind of put me right next to Ram Dass. And, uh, and that picture I looked at afterwards, or I posted it to social media. Someone was like, look at you, like you're in the middle. Like the, it's like Jack has his hand on my shoulder. Yeah, and it's like in, in this warm circle of like love and, and support. So, yeah, man. So I did the podcast for many years and I haven't done an episode in about two years. Um, my last one was when I was living in Connecticut. I went out to Cosm, Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, to uh, have my really good friends, Alex and Allison Gray. Oh, they're wonderful. Uh, I, yeah, I adore them. I've taught at Cosm. Here's a funny little story for you. Um, I So that morning, it, it was only about an hour drive and I taught many workshops at Cosm, some with Alex and Allison, some with other people, some on my own. And that morning I woke up getting ready to leave and drive out. And uh, sometimes I like checking my Facebook memories. It's just kind of fun to see what I was doing a few years ago or even a year ago. And five years ago to the day, I didn't know this until that morning, was the day that I taught my first workshop at Cosm. And uh, and I remember I, I told Alex and Allison and their assistant, John, that. And, um, you know, John's a friend. Uh, I met him the first the first workshop I did, I was running the span neurosis. They're like a do me. Oh, no. I'm okay. very familiar with neurosis. Okay. So yeah, they're one of my all time. We, we listen to like the same stuff, man. I grew oh, up perfect. Okay. hardcore and punk music. <laughs> perfect. All right. So I'm speaking your language. Yeah, so yeah. I'm wearing a neurosis shirt and he's from Boston and he grew up in like bands like overcast and hardcore that I love new England hardcore. And so we started nerding out and immediately we became friends. But anyways, John was there when I was doing the podcast with them a few years ago and Alex is, I mentioned that to all of them. And, and this is, by the way, they gave me my second private tour of Entheon before it opened up. Oh, and wow. both times the three of us held hands and they, we did three ohms. And it's just like, I'm like, how is this my real life? Like <laughs> I'm, I'm with the grays and John and John videotaped the second time. The first time, actually the tour was me, the grays, my ex at the time. And my friend, Jessica Pimentel, who is, was an actress on Orange is the New Black. She sings for a really cool uh, Tibetan Buddhist hardcore band, Alakin's Gun. Oh, that's and cool. her fiance, now husband, he was there. He's the drummer, Thomas Hawk from Ashuga. Huh. So I'm getting a tour of <laughs> fucking Entheon with my right. friend Jessica <laughs> and Thomas from Ashuga and Alex. And I'm like, this is my life. Like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> um, but anyway, so when I mentioned that about, about five years, they were like, oh, that's not a coincidence. Another Maharaji moment. And Alex had just finished. I don't know if you've seen this, but that print he did of Ram Dass. Yeah, yeah. The one with the Maharaji above him. And yeah. 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 So he uh he's like, We've got to gift you one. They made 300 copies. And uh afterwards, John took me down and they gave me a copy of that with a really nice cosm seal of authenticity. And what was really meaningful to me about that, aside from just the gesture and, and knowing Maharaji was kind of at, at bay at that was um the version of the only dance there is w- on that cover because they've since updated it was the one that i found i bought it for a dollar at a used bookstore that's the one i'd read and then 
over on the right corner is the cover of his second to last book. We're all just walking each other home. Right. And what's super cool about that was um, they Mirabai had asked me, um, she talked to Ramdas and they wanted me to write an endorsement for that. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> really? Still, that's that shit still is crazy to me. Cause you know, Pete Holmes is writing them. Like, I don't know, all these big time Helen Hunt, like real like known people. And I'm just like you, this like punk rock misfit weirdo skateboarder that's <laughs> just trying to help people. Right. And so that's in the print. And I was like, man, how cool. So that's another thing that's in storage right now that I'll be getting next week. And um, and I'm jazzed to get that. I'll actually be able to frame it and put it up in where I'm moving to. And like I've never framed it in two years. It's just been kind of hanging <laughs> out. So that's how I got to know Ram Dubs. <laughs> I tell stories. I apologize. Oh I mean, no, man. I'm a I'm a storyteller right myself yeah. for sure. That dude, that's awesome. That's like what how fucking surreal, right? It's like when well, you first picked up, you know, the first Eckhart Tolle book. Yeah. Like, could you even fucking imagine that that would be your life? You know? <laughs> oh, and, and here's another cool thing. So my other teacher outside of Ramdas is Ken Wilbur. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work or not. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Ken, they're, they're kind of different. Um, Ramdas to me is like my heart teacher. Ken is more of my mind, but there's inter there's, uh, they intersect, you know, because Ramdas is also very intellectual. Ken is also very loving, but that's just the way like my weird humanness kind of equates them in my experience. But Ken's work is about, you know, deeply about consciousness. And um, the people have called him the Einstein of consciousness of our day. You know, it's very impressive work. He's a map maker. He's brilliant, like next level, like insanely intelligent. And I remember while I was going to that library I mentioned, you know, where I found Be Here Now, yeah. there was a 12 CD set called Cosmic Consciousness um, with a K, uh, Cosmic Consciousness, that Tammy Simon, the founder of Sounds True, had put out. Um, it was like a, I don't know, 12 disc CDs, probably about 15 hours of conversation, something like that. And uh, I remember I took it out. I understood maybe one or 2% of it way over my head, but seeds were being planted. And I started reading Ken's work and um, a brief history of everything. And then Grace and Grit, One Taste, um, all of these books that were a little more accessible of his work to me. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with that. And I've been very blessed to have Ken on my podcast and He's had me on his podcast and we've done a six hour series together called Hardcore Spirit. And uh, and we just took to each other. And so the surreal part there was after my first book, Indie Spirituals, came out, mm -hmm. uh, that was with Simon and & Schuster and uh, Atria Beyond Words. Sounds True immediately bought um, a second book. Uh, I had already written half of it and they on the spot were like, we want this book. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, Rad, I love Sounds True. You know, you're amazing. You, I have so many books by you guys. And um, so the the crazy part was I'm like, you know, I'm going to ask Ken if he'll write the forward for this. And he was psyched to do that. So oh, come cool. full circle, another like 10, 12 years later of me taking that book out or that DVD set, there's Ken writing the forward. And sounds true, Tammy Simon, who had that conversation, they're publishing it. And I was just like, whoa, dude, you know, like, how cool is that? So, yeah, what I bring that back to, man, is like, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. You know, I've not been an awesome human at times. Like, my heart's always been like a good heart, but like being someone who was an alcoholic or I'll always be an alcoholic, but like, I've done shitty things, you know, like I've never raped or, or stolen, like, you know, killed anyone, but emotionally i've been unskillful you know but like what when good things like that happen and when i'm doing well and i get out of my own way to me that's what a gift from the universe saying like hey we see you or i see you whatever it sees me um because when i'm doing well i do my best each day to lay myself aside it's like all right help me remove me from me you know my star Eckhart, the christian uh, mystic said, I, I don't remember verbatim, but like, I pray to God to remove me of, of God, uh, of myself, of my notions. I just want to be like, just take me out of the equation so that you can flow through me, you right. know, like, let me just be a servant. And, and that's, I really mean that dude. Like, yeah, I got to put food on the table and I want to make a living, but it's like, I just want to help human beings. And, um, 
And to me, when the universe shows up and aligns me with people like that, it's like, cool. Like it sees it. And, and it's a reminder, like it's a gentle, like, like, shoulder rub you know like hey you're doing okay you're doing the right thing so because i question myself all the time dude all the time every day like am i good enough am i like helping enough people like i get in my head but like ramdas says and i try to remember i come back to my heart and it's like be here now take a moment be here now be here now so yeah yeah man that's man that's just fucking beautiful like seriously that's just a really beautiful thing. You know, you. I, I, I'm I'm very much the same, right? Like I just try to help as many people as possible. And that's just yeah. the, name of the game for me. It's like, yeah. because I, I, like you, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a former heroin user and like I've done some like ill shit, you know? Yeah. And like, yeah. yeah, man, this, like hearing your story is just like, it's so fucking inspiring, right? Like, like Hey, this is like, things do work out right <laughs> and so is yours you know like rad dude like you know not rad that you went through that but rad to look at what you're doing i mean how I, mean, I mean kind of rad that i went through it just because like i, I don't i don't know if i'd be doing what i'm doing now right. if it hadn't have been for those experiences right yeah so fuck yeah rad you went through it yeah right. let's I, let's own that shit because you're right man like i don't the one thing i regret is the emotional pain I've put on people I care about, like my family, you know, but the nice part of it is they see where I am today and they see that I'm showing up to the best of my ability every day. It's not easy, dude, at all. You know, like going from like a nice two bedroom apartment in West Hartford, paying a very reasonable amount of rent to renting a very small room at the moment. Like I was saying, like in a sterile environment where I have no are like I'm renting they're a lovely couple they're a Mexican couple they're 55 years old um it's in a like senior mobile living community so like the floors are linoleum it's not actual wood the past week I've seen a couple of cockroaches right. uh, I found out yesterday that there's rats like they put poison out um I didn't know we had rats here and I also found out a couple of days ago that the guy um he's super nice he's been sick COVID was going around. I got that again the second time. I thought maybe he got it. No, I found out he has cancer. He has a tumor. Like he's not doing well. So like, I'm not saying like, woe is me, dude, because I'm not about that. It's But it's like, that's the reality of my life right now is like, I'm renting this small room. I have, I see people dying at work. I come home. There's people like literally, I don't know that he's dying right now, but he's not well, you know, and, 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 and I don't know that he's going to get better. He's disabled. He can't work. He had a gnarly accident. And it's like, what am I going to do with that, man? Am I going to go do a bunch of drugs? Am I going to pick up a bottle and numb myself? Part of me still to this day is like, wow, that'd be easier. But That's an option. Be, <laughs> yeah. But really, I know where that leads me. Best case scenario. Best case, I'm back in a jail cell. I'm back in an emergency room. I'm back in a 30, 60, 90 day program yeah. starting all over. And, you know, I'm 45. I'm not young. I'm not old, but it's like, no, dude, like I, I'm here. I'm still alive. Like it's a miracle. I'm sure it is for you too, bro. Like, you know, <laughs> you do, like fuck. that's one drug I never fucked with. Like right. I snorted it, you know, a couple of times I never injected it. Um, but I've, I've lost people to that, you know, and I've seen the horror same with anything, alcohol, you know, how it goes, Yeah, dude. Yeah. but like shit, dude, if I'm still alive, like I was intubated at one point, you know, my poor parents had to see that I, you know, I wasn't breathing on my own. They had to rush me to the freaking emergency room. But for whatever reason, I made it. So it's like, dude, I've got to make this mean something now. You know, it's time to do that. It's time to, like, get my shit together as tough as it is, show up and and just be the best servant to humanity and learn to take care of me, too, because I always, for the longest time, struggled with that. But I'm learning to do that, too, because you know what? I'm worth that as well. And if I'm not taking care of myself, how can I take care of others? And that's part of what precipitated my relapse, like working with teens. And, um, and, and I loved doing that. You know, they were using a couple of my books as part of their curriculum. I was working with 13 to 19 year olds for about seven years doing as an independent contractor, going in, teaching workshops, teaching meditation, doing guitar meditation, like, um, you know, coping skills. Yeah. And these are 13 and 19 year olds that you know, arms all cut up, burned up, suicide attempts, eating disorders, you know, like transgender struggling with identity. And I would bring that home with me, you know, and, and some of them didn't make it, 
you know, like they didn't make it, whether it was suicide or overdose. Some of them did. And I got some really cool messages um, after the fact, like, you know, things that I did to help them. And I don't take credit for that. It's just like, it's cool to know that what we do in the world, we never know the impact we're going to have, you know, ripple effects, one random act of kindness or one intentional act of kindness. Who knows how far that will ripple? Imagine, dude, if like more of us fucking did that, like, so I'm just trying to do that each day, you know, like show up and do that. Take care of myself, take care of my brothers and sisters in this world. And, uh, and just, you know, one day at a time, be there, show up for it. Yeah, man. I mean, that's the name of the game, right? Like just, yeah. just try to help people. That's it. I mean, like if, if I could sum life up in, in one phrase, it's just like, just help people, you know, Yeah. just, oh, yeah. or just be fucking kind. Like how difficult is it to be kind, man? I was like out a uh, Christmas shopping the other day and I had to get, I did this a uh, potluck for the meditation group that I facilitate. And so awesome. I had to, you know, get some stuff for that and, you know, some groceries and to, for yeah. to bring it. And I was like in the store and just, you know, just kind of observing people while I'm shopping and man, like people are just so ugly to each other. No, I it's know. so ugly. And I, I was just like, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. It, was, it really just heartbreaking, it, you know, I, bottom line. It was like, my, my heart was just like, I went in and I was in a good mood. Like, yeah, Christmas shopping for the, the potluck. It's going to be awesome. And by the time I left, I was just like, God, that was just tragic. Like that whole, whole adventure was just awful. It was just, I know, man, it's, and it's like, you know, that's part of the reminder of like working again and, you know, being back in corporate America is you know, I can't say everybody, but people are so overworked, so underpaid, you know, just scratching or, or clawing to get, keep their head afloat. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't have kids. Like part of me is super bummed about that, but at the same time, thank goodness I don't have kids right now to try to take care of and, and emotionally and financially. Like, um, so I, I, it's not lost on me that there's people out there that are struggling and like, life is so difficult you know it's it's it, we're force fed like buy consume like that equals happiness get over on other people make money work hard and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with hard work right yeah. but like it's just like we're we're indoctrinated at such a young age oh yeah misinformed what happiness is and then people are glued to the television and the news i was thinking about this last night there are absolute horrors happening in the world there is no doubt about that it's 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 so hard to even think about but also there are beautiful things happening in the world people forget like they think you think of the whole world it's a huge world right. there are tragedies happening in you know jerusalem and, and with all of that fighting there are are or israel there are tragedies happening in ukraine and i am not making light of that at all this is horrible stuff there are tragedies happening in the united states every day molestation rape people losing their homes but there's also a lot of beautiful things happening in this world That's the true. news doesn't remind us of that no. you know they don't remind <laughs> us that there are people doing random acts of kindness there are other countries that are happy right now you know that um, there are communities of people that meditate and are just, you know, like there are monasteries and and whatever faith you believe in, you know, there are good people that are trying to bring balance or hold balance, um, you know, by this <laughs> as best they can. Um, but, you know, we're not as a society, they don't remind us of that. You know, we have to take the initiative to to do that. And it's kind of funny to me because my fourth book just came out, a book that explores horror movies and mental health and there's a real intersection there to me um and i love that book but shortly thereafter a lot's happened for me in the last couple of weeks it's been very jarring and it's like damn i don't want to watch horror movies right now i don't want i don't want to put that the news on like i don't want to have my head in the sand right. but you know right now i would rather focus my time on my heart and like meditation and raising my vibration things to be honest with you like even six months ago saying stuff like that i might have like scoffed at myself but like right now that's that's the best i can do you know show up and just like just continue working on my heart and my compassion and trying to bring that into the world to the best of my ability and having these conversations with people real conversations not ones where it's like 
it's all love and light or whatever, or it's all doom and gloom. Good, no, good vibes only. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's like it's like you know Ken Wilber's book is grace and grit. You know, there it's two sides of the same coin. Yeah, you can't light without the dark, but let's not focus only on the dark, and let's not forget also to cultivate the light in our lives. You know, that's so important. Like taking time to focus on gratitude every day instead of turning the news on first thing fuck the yeah. news Turn that shit off take a break <laughs> focus on gratitude make a good cup of coffee right. go for a walk send a nice email or a text to somebody just cheerleading them for whatever reason dude just like hey you know like good job on this or that or just let them know you appreciate them like yeah. hey i love you you know like thank you for no reason who cares dude like lift people up you know like that stuff there's a lot of neuroscience. It's beyond the scope of what we can talk about, I'm sure. And I'm I'm not like Bruce Lipton or Greg Braddon, like, to, <laughs> you know, Joe Dispenza, all people. I love their work. Like, I don't want to butcher it, but like, do some research on that stuff. Spend some time reading articles, read their books, go on YouTube, you know, like check out some, some YouTube things about, about epigenetics, about changing the cellular structure, about cultivating gratitude and kindness, about what real happiness is. There's a really cool YouTube page I stumbled on. I think I've probably seen videos of theirs in the past, but um, just recently called After School. And school spelled S. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've seen their videos. Oh, yeah, dude. I like That's what I'm spending my time. If I'm not reading or meditating and catching up on work, I'm watching videos on their page. Like yeah. when I walk into work each morning now, I feel like I walk a mile and a half. That's something I'm doing now is I put my headphones in and I pull up like a talk from Ram Dass or Alan Watts or this morning I listened to one from Bruce Lipton. You know, like there's some great, great material on that there and it's free. If more of us start doing that, maybe it's not too late, man. I don't know. Maybe it is, but maybe it's not. Like I will always hold on to hope. You know, I will always hold on to that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what else is there, right? No, it's, yeah, I've told the story a million times, but for your listeners that might not have had it, it's worth repeating. Um, you know, I have the word hope tattooed on my knuckles. And I got that after I got out of my very first detox uh, in 2003 or 2004. Mm. First time like I ever ended up in a detox it was in Middletown, Connecticut, a place called Rushford. And, um, and that place did a lot for me. I'm very grateful to that place. But I went to a detox. Then I did a 27 day or 28 day intensive treatment program. And then I think like a two or three month halfway house, then to sober living. But when I got to sober living, um, not, but, but when I got to sober living, I remember um, it was really important to me, hope, you know, that it's like hope. So I got that tattooed on my knuckles as a reminder. Fast forward 14 months later, um, I was in Rome staying with a girl I was kind of seeing at the time. She's from Connecticut. I'd met her at work, um, but she was a language major going to Trinity college and I'm Italian and always wanted to visit Italy. And she, that's where she worked for the last several years as a tour guide. And she's mm -hmm. like, hey, if you pay for your plane ticket, you got a free place to stay. I'll take some days off and show you around. Nice. Um, and so it was cool. Her birthday was June 1st. Mine's June 3rd. So I flew over on June 1st. Uh, I remember we went out. And so again, 14 months sober. She um, she drank, but wasn't alcoholic or anything. And I didn't care. I was like, whatever. Uh, fast forward a couple of days. It was June 3rd, my birthday. And I'm like, you know, it's been 14 months. I can drink. Like, I'm maybe I'm not an alcoholic. You know, that old uh, oh, mistake. <laughs> last, I really didn't know, you know. And um, even even though I had been told, I just, I wanted to, you know, I still had research to do. I think. this theory out. <laughs> yeah. But so the reason I say that is I'll never forget, you know, so I had, of course, like several drinks. I didn't get blackout drunk, but I remember like the trains in Rome run like all hours of the night. And so we were heading back. We, we were down like, I don't know, downtown with all the cool sculptures and just Rome is incredible. I had like this big Foster's can of beer and uh, and I remember sitting there and there's just like 80 year old man kind of sitting diagonally from me and he was looking at me and uh, and I'm used to people looking at me I'm pretty heavily tattooed but usually <laughs> when you catch someone looking at you they glance away pretty quick right. um, this guy didn't and and so over the course of like three or four minutes I looked at him like three times and uh and he didn't break con eye contact with me. And I was like, oh man, how do I handle this? Like, <laughs> it, you know, but here's the beautiful thing that happened. He, uh, he pointed down at my hands 
and or my hand and, and he said hope and his broken english accent and i was like yeah he goes hope it's the last to die hope it's the last to die and i remember like oh cool and i smiled at him he smiled at me and that was it we got off a couple stops later um i got back from that trip and i remember my dad picked me up at the airport and he could tell already i was drinking and he knew and i remember like just you know the sadness i could see in his eyes yeah Uh, I ended up in another like emergency room and detox and, um, and that happened a few more times after that, but that man, you know, I don't know if there's angels or not or whatever, but like at some of my lowest points in my life, it's as if that man whispered into my ears, like hope it's the last to die. So when I've wanted to give up, when I've been super empty, like when I've had nothing, it's like this little ember of a flicker of like a flame on a candle it's it's like still there it, it wants to go out but it just isn't willing to and at those times you know more than one occasion i've heard that like whispered in my ear hope it's the last to die and uh and i know hope like pema children who i love has talked about like um again i don't i don't, I don't verbatim but hope can be a dangerous thing and like and i get that like naive hope but i don't i i believe it's i believe it's important you know it, hope with actions, you know, with, with yeah, yeah. willful I mean, intentional actions, not just sitting around hoping like, hey, <laughs> no, we've got to do something. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta put the work in for sure. Exactly. Yeah. But man, if you don't have hope, then you're hopeless. Right. And right. like, and I've been hopeless in uh, yeah. that's a shitty fucking place to be, bro. Like, yeah. There's nothing that feels fucking worse than feeling absolutely hopeless. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you, man, like, how did you pull yourself out of that? And like, get to where you are and you're doing your podcast and we have all these similarities. What, what uh, about you? Shit, man. Uh, let's see. I'm like, so I, uh, man, I just, I just got tired of it, dude. Sick and tired of being sick. and tired. Yeah, I just got tired of it. Uh, you know, I was, yeah. I was basically like homeless in new Orleans at the time. And I was like, I got, I got to go back home and I'm from uh, Pensacola, Florida. So sure. I, I caught, uh, I caught a Greyhound to mobile and then, yeah jumped from mobile back over to Pensacola and was like staying with a friend of mine and still yeah. using. And, you know, like, and I just got, you know, I was trying to get into a, a state run rehab here into the, uh, uh road, <laughs> road to recovery, uh, Lakeview program. Yeah. And, um, I was trying to get into that and was talking to my mom, like, Hey, I really want to go to rehab. Like I really can't live like this anymore. you know, and I uh, just really, really regretful, really just, you know, devoid of any hope at that sure. point. And, uh, uh, she, uh, it was like the day it was like right around Christmas. And then like, she called me two days after Christmas, uh, 2018. And she was like, yeah, she was like, get, get your stuff. Uh, we're going to go. I was like, um, I didn't get in anywhere yet. And she's like, I got you in somewhere. Get your stuff. Cool. I'm going to go. Wow. Uh, and she took me and, uh, we went and, uh, checked in to a place here, uh, kind of down the road, uh, called Gulf breeze recovery. And it's like a holistic treatment center and, yeah. and, uh, went through the, their program and got out and was doing pretty well for a while. And then relapsed at the, like the end of 2020 and yeah. was it like back out for like three months. And then, uh, you know, immediately was like, well, I got to get this shit under control. Like immediately. Cause like at the time I was like in school and, you know, I was still getting good grades and I mm, had a place and was doing the whole thing. And like, I guess you could call me like a functioning addict at the time. Yeah, I've been there too. Sure. But you know, ultimately like, you know, we play the tape for it. We know where that's going. It so, only lasts so long. Uh, so like, I, I basically just like, I, I got, I finally did get into the, the original rehab that I was going to go to in 2018. Okay. But like I was like, you know, I can't check in until I finish this semester of school. Like I was like, I got to finish this semester. I'm not going to tank, you know, this whole semester just because I need sure. to go. And it was pretty close to that time anyway. But uh, yeah, I got in there, man, and just and since then, just been completely clean, man. I just, it's amazing. I I can't even imagine, you know, going back to that life at this point, right? Like I say, it just seems so far removed. I mean, but you know, obviously, I don't forget what it was like, right? But I just couldn't imagine like that being my life again, right? I it's so looking back on it, it's so fucking weird to like imagine that was my life in the first place, like right how dark did things have to get for me to, to end up where I was at? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, uh, well, brother, like I, I resonate. First of all, thank you for your heart and your transparency. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, like um, it's it's good getting to know you. Like, yeah, we're we're cut from the same cloth for sure. But just you know, again, to be transparent, like here I am, someone who's written three books, right, majorly published. I ended up in California because I relapsed in Connecticut and was very suicidal. I checked myself into a psychiatric ward twice over the course of three months. Um. You know, like I, I went to a 30 day program in Pennsylvania. It didn't take like, um, and I knew there, I told them, I'm like, something's not clicking for me. It wasn't their fault. I just, right. I wasn't there mentally. Yeah. I got back to my apartment in West Hartford within five minutes was drinking again and back at the psychiatric hospital again. And while I was there, um, a friend who I didn't know him super well, we he's become a, a dear friend, but um, he read my stuff and we were friends on Facebook. Yeah. I was like, Hey man, I'm at this music-based sober living house in LA. Um, I think you could get a scholarship here. He knows I'm a musician. I've never done anything famous, but I've been in bands. I've recorded albums, released them, and there's some on Apple Music and stuff. And he's like, he put me in touch with this woman. Uh, it's a program that the Grammys do called Music Cares for Musicians. I've heard about that. And um, yeah, it's a great program. So I filled out like the day I got out of that treatment, I went to my apartment, I filled out this like eight page application I'd already been in touch with the woman who ran the program. And like within a couple of hours, they were like, yep, we we're scholarshipping you for 90 days. Awesome. Um, you got to pay for your plane ticket. And I was like, dope. So I get out there. Um, I had like a week or so window and I stayed sober, you know, like I wasn't using anything. Um, and I got out there and um, I was there for maybe about a month or so. I just paid like fifteen hundred dollars to have my car shipped out from connecticut it was a nice subaru like still had a bunch of a long it had a long life ahead of it but um i ended up relapsing like a couple days after that because i still wasn't ready and i was scared like all my family you mentioned family right all my family's in connecticut um i know a couple of people out in san diego i'm in la at this point but um i didn't know anybody there um they were very good to me. It was a great house. Um, it was called Genesis House, G House. Scott Weiland went through that house before he passed away. Jerry Cantrell from Allison Chains went through there. It wasn't like a nice ritzy house. It was a normal house, but like they had a music room and there was drums and guitars and basses. And I, you know, I got to jam with them and it was cool, but I ended up relapsing and um and hard. And I came down, I I put a post up, I got kicked out and I was in my car. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I put a post on Facebook, you know, does anybody have a spot I can stay And somebody in Hillcrest, San Diego? Yeah. 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 They were like, yeah, you know, I read your book. Like you can come here. So I stayed at another person's house in LA, a stranger, but they knew who I was. They, they were kind. And, uh, and yeah, man, it's sad because like I did that and I was, but you know, once you start drinking, you're it's on and, uh, or any drug. And so I woke up that morning ready to leave. I guess that night I had driven to a package store. I must have like driven into a wall because the front end of my hood was up. My check engine lights were on. Um, it, there was no paint on it. I hadn't hit a vehicle or anything, but like it was like shit, man. And I didn't remember what happened. Like, and I, for listeners, I, just, I hope it goes without saying, like, this mortifies me. Like, I am not proud of that. I have a lot of guilt and shame. And, but I want to talk about it because that's the reality of this illness. Like, I'm a good human being that cares and and will put everything into helping humanity. But when you're lost in that, dude, you do things you would normally would never, ever do. So I was driving down from L.A. to San Diego that next morning. My car broke down. Mm. Uh, like it started fuming. I'm like, oh, come on, dude. You're just a mile in, or an hour and a half. You're halfway there. It was in Orange County. Broke down. I had to pull over in the left lane and uh, I called the tow truck. I had all my belongings, which wasn't much. But um, before the tow truck came, a, a female officer came and I didn't lie. I was I was over the legal limit, but I wasn't blacked out for an alcoholic. I was functioning, you know, sadly, that's what you need to do to like not, you know, to function. And uh, but I got a DUI and I spent the night in jail and I took a bus the next morning. I remember I got out. I went to CVS. Uh, I bought a thing of Listerine because I didn't have any money. I drank Listerine. You know, I've done that in the past. I've drank hand sanitizer when I got out to California. Like it was horrible, dude, like really bad. Um, and so that happened. I went through a few different treatment programs in San Diego. 
And what made me think of this, and what I'm sharing is when you mentioned the homeless thing, um, I had gone through another program. I was at Sober Living in Golden Hills, San Diego, relapsed again, still wasn't there yet, and ended up, I'd been trying to get into a detox for a few weeks. And I had my dear friend, Carrie from Connecticut, um, she lives out here in Vista. She was trying to help me. Another friend, Michelle Ann, was trying to help me. I ended up staying with her after I got kicked out. Um, and I was still drinking. She's a person in recovery. And I, I, it wasn't cool for me to be there. So out of the kindness of her heart, she paid for me to go to a hotel for three nights. And was like, I hope you figure it out. And, uh, and on the end of the third night, I don't remember anything, but I woke up in the emergency room again, not remembering how I got there naked, like under a blanket. I had no clothes. They had to find me clothes out of the donation bin at the hospital the next morning. Um, they got me a, a cab fare to get me back to the hotel where my very few belongings, like my wallet, my glasses, I didn't have those with me. My clothes were there. And when I got there, you know, the guy pulled me aside. It's like, Hey man, like your room was in shambles. There was broken glass all over the floor, blood on the floor. You pissed your bed. Like I had to pay the maids extra. I've never seen anything like that. I was super sorry. You know, I apologize to the maids. I still need to go back there and I want to make an amends and, you know, like tip those maids. I don't have the money, but I told them when I do, I will, you know, and that's something I will do. Um, and then another guy who also worked there, he pulled me aside while I was walking outside and he said, uh, Hey, I don't know you, but I just want to let you know, man, like last year we had a guy here that was similar to you and his girlfriend asked us to not let him stay here but you know he wasn't being a nuisance to residents and he wasn't being loud so we couldn't not legally and he's like you know uh, we found him dead after like three days like you he he drank himself to death in his room he's like i don't want to see you be that person man and you know i i that morning by the way I, while i was waiting I, w I waited two and a half hours at the hospital outside waiting for that that cab to come and I was starting to have panic attacks because, you know, the alcohol is in my system. I would go into these sliding doors and they had um, a hand sanitizer foamy thing that would shoot down the little foam hand sanitizer. And every time like a couple would go in to check in because there was a security guard there, I would go because he was distracted and have a bunch of the hand sanitizer poured into my hands. And I would start licking it out of my hands when I got outside. That's the depths of where I was at. So anyways, that was while I was waiting for this cab to go back to the um, to that hotel. By the grace of Ramdas Maharaji, God, pure luck. I don't believe it was luck. I shouldn't have even said that. By the grace of life, she found, my friend Carrie found this place called the First Step House in Carlsbad, which is really known in, in North County. Like, it's an iconic place. It's a 10-day non-medical detox uh, that's a house. It's dangerous because you're not medically detoxing. I've never med non-medically detoxed, right. detoxed, but uh, they had a bed open up and I went there and I remember I had to sit there until like four o'clock after my initial interview and I got there around 10 to wait to get like my bed. And so I'm outside. I just want to lay down and go to bed. I'm sweating. The withdrawals are kicking in. I, I blew a point zero at that point. Most people when they arrive there are drunk. I, I wasn't. I was like already going into withdrawals. And I'm sharing that because that experience saved my life and changed my life. A 10 day non-medical detox, dude, like I had to feel everything, my thoughts, the physical withdrawals, the throwing up, the, the diarrhea, the no, not eating for five days, the not sleeping for five days, the literal nightmares when I would sleep, uh, scared the shit out of me, but also softened my heart so much. And it reconnected me. I, I had lost my not lost. It was a very rusty relationship with the higher power of my understanding with, with the universe, with whatever you care to call it. Right. But I remember sitting on that back patio, man. And, and that happened again. And I found this amazing sponsor who was volunteering there. Who's my sponsor today, the student Nathaniel, you know, that I love, like he loves like um, the guy that wrote the forward for my last book that did John dies at the end, Jason Pargan. Um, he, I love that dude, you know, like, and he wrote the forward and, and I was talking to Nathaniel, he took me to a meeting at the house and we were talking about authors and he loved Jason. And I was like, dude, he's writing the forward for my book. And we just clicked. And so that wasn't a coincidence. You know, again, that was the universe to me, at least showing up being like, you're ready. Here's some support. And so here I am, dude, on Saturday, I'll have six months. That's, That's not awesome. a lot. I'll tell you, it's the best six months of sobriety I've ever fucking had. 
man, six, dude, six months is a fucking milestone. Like, yeah, it is. It, 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 it's like, well, it, cause I, you know, I, I, I'm in a 12 step program and I do, you know, also do some like Buddhist recovery stuff. But yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear people come into rooms, you know, all the time and like, I've only got three days and I'm like, dude, you've amazing. Had three fucking days. Like, yeah, how, many, how long has it been since you've had three days? Right. Like, don't, don't, don't negate yourself. Don't discount that shit, dude. Like, right. keep going. Like, you've got three fucking days, bro. Like, that's astonishing for people like us. It's literally a miracle, man, because our bodies become wired to be, to drink, to do drugs. That, you know, we're now equating that with survival. So, 24 hours, two days, three days is a miracle. Fucking six hours, you know, like How, if, yeah, if you're listening to this and you've got, if you're struggling and you, you know, you get a little bit of time, like don't, don't discount yourself. Like any time at all is beautiful and it's a, it's miraculous. 100%. Absolutely. And if you're listening to this and, and you're, you've gone through what Justin and I have, or you don't know what to do, like there's hope again, going back to hope. Cause check it. Like I, when I woke up in that emergency room, I was talking to my friend, Matt and Encinitas. I told him I woke up naked. He's like, dude, that wasn't just metaphoric. You literally were stripped of everything. Like you were like a a brand new child. And I was like, Whoa, dude, I didn't think of it like that. But yeah, he was right. Like I, everything was gone. I lost my car, no money. I was literally about to be homeless. I had nowhere to go. If that detox bed didn't open, I was going to be sleeping on the street that night. So, you know, but there for the grace go I or whatever that saying is, but, you know, please know if you're listening and you can relate to this and you don't know what to do, like, just do the next right thing. Like I went from that place to a two and a half month program that I was miserable at, but I also found gratitude every day. It was like 60 other dudes, a lot of them court ordered, not many were there to get well. People were relapsing every day. Like, and here I am, like the showers didn't work. We had this like portable shower thing outside and it stunk. And it was like the living accommodations, the food was terrible, but I every day found gratitude because I wasn't drinking. Right. And from there I went to sober living and it lined up that if I was doing outpatient, they, w- they would pay for my sober living for 30 to 60 days. And that's how I was able to find a job. And once I found that job, I saved a little money. And I moved to this room I'm in now and just, you know, I'm in a room and sure, man, there's cockroaches and rats, like literally like here, but I'm moving in a couple, in a week and a half to another room, like that's in a house in a nicer area. Like it's a smaller room and it's more rent, but it's a step in like the the right direction. And it'll allow me to get to work, you know, whether walking or public transpo and I'm celebrating that win. Is it where I want to be in life right now? No, but six months ago, I was about to be homeless. So right. dude, I'm doing okay. And if I can do this, <laughs> nothing, like no one's giving me money. Like no one's supporting me. Like my family loves me and they've helped where they can. Like my dad kindly did send me a couple hundred bucks recently. Like I didn't ask him to, but like he knew I was struggling. Like, but outside of that little help, I did all of this, not on my own. I, my The legwork was there, but I asked for help. It's okay to ask yeah, for man. help. Please, yeah. man. Fuck the ego. Fuck the like, the, the, like you know i'm gonna burden somebody people like to help people most people dude i believe are inherently good man so yeah. ask for help yeah. yeah that's that's one of the like biggest lessons that i've had to learn too right because yeah. like you know as addicts we're fucking stubborn we're yeah. stuck looking people and i i don't know about you man but it took me like it it took me so much to just reach out and be like you know hey I fucking need help. Like, I can't, I can't do this on my own, you know, like yeah. what, and whatever it is, you know, we, we could come up with hypotheticals, but like, you don't have to do this on your own. Right. Absolutely. You don't have to, you know, there right. are people out there who will help you. Yeah. One thing I heard, one, one thing I heard, uh, some guy fucking pulled me in jail one time. Uh, yeah. That's a long story too, but uh, he told me, you know, a closed mouth doesn't eat. That's right. I've heard that too such such so true dude so true thank you for saying that and i and i do want to also say to anybody struggling that's listening something i wish i had learned earlier in life or taken the time to cultivate is self-compassion mm. being gentle with ourselves you know being kind with ourselves yeah if you're struggling right now dude even if you're not an addict whatever we're all humans you know like I mean, we're, we're all, all recovered right? or something yeah like to something <laughs> 
like, man, try to give yourself a break. You know, like, don't listen to the fuckery that that is the committee in the head. Like, I know it's easy to, and I do sometimes too. But like, man, like you're still alive. You still got a chance. Please reach out for help. You know, like go online, Google help. Like there, there are ways. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes a little time. Sometimes if you're in an active alcohol phase right now, like you might have to keep drinking until you get into that detox because you don't want to have a seizure. It sucks, man. Like just do your best to maintain. But like be as gentle with yourself as you can. And please like listen to Justin and I that like, dude, you can do this. You can, there is help. Even if you don't have family, if you don't have friends, if you're listening to this, you have some way to like get online, get online, research like medical detox. If you need to go to the emergency room, go to the emergency room. If you need to stay on a friend or family member's couch, ask them, you know, like try not to do this alone because it's impossible to do it alone. You can't, you can't. No, that it's completely impossible to do it alone. And I think that's like one of the real reasons that, you know, programs like NA and, uh, you know, um, recovery Dharma, any of the, the like recovery groups, the reason they work is because they're a group. It's the right. fellowship, you know, like yeah. we could go back to like old school Buddhism and, you know, like we take refuge in the Sangha and, you know, right. even, even the Buddha said that like the Sangha is the whole of the holy life. Right? right. Like you can't do any of this shit on your own, whether you're trying to get clean, whether you're trying to really deepen your spiritual practice, yeah. help, ask for help, ask for help. There's people out there that are willing to help you and want to help you. And, yeah, and they, it's been my experience that guess what? Helping people feels fucking good. So people like feeling good. So they're going to help you just so they can feel good about that. <laughs> Right, dude. And I believe yeah. absolutely. It could, and you know, I don't say that in a Pollyannish way. I say that on my own direct experience. Yeah. And I do believe, man, it's not believe, I've seen it time and again. The universe will conspire in our favor if we're willing to show up and do the work. If, you know, like we can do our best to get out of our own way. I really believe that, man. Like, you know, like, yeah, there's a lot of chaos and disorder, but, you know, like we, we're we're miraculous beings, all of us. And we are capable of so many incredible things, but we got to start from where we are and really take an honest look at, all right, where am I today and create an action plan? What do I need to do? What's the next viable step? You know, try not to like do it all at once, you know, cause you're just going to overwhelm yourself and it's easy to give up, but like, yeah, man, like grab a pen and paper, pull up your word document, put it in your notes on your phone or your computer. Like, where am I? Where do I want to be? And how am I going to get there? Right. And if you don't know, or you have some ideas, like call a friend, research it online. Like, you know, like how have people done this? I need help. Where's help? Like watch videos on YouTube, Google, like they are your friend, you know, like there's ways to do it. There really are. The only excuse that for me I can come up with is are the ones I make, yeah. you know, and, and right. I don't mean that to invalidate anybody, you know, like, uh, cause I felt invalidated before and, and that's not a good feeling. So I don't mean to offend anybody, but like, if we really want to do it, we can, we can. Absolutely. Man, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with me, bro. It's been thank you. really fucking good talking to you and just like getting to know you, like on a more personal level, we've interacted on Facebook a few times here and there and, you know, message back and forth a little bit, but you know, yeah. we've actually been able to have an honest conversation and man, it's okay. a, it's been, it's been really beautiful, man. And you're, you're an amazing soul and, and just, yeah. you know, your, your capacity for compassion and just trying to help people and, and, you know, just sending that message, right? Like there is hope. Yeah. Always. It's the last to die, man. So yeah, thank you. It's been an honor. This has been super, super cool. I've been doing all my stuff around my new book. So this was fun to like kind of lay that aside and just have a human conversation. So right. I appreciate what you're doing. Congrats on your wellness and the world. Thank you for doing the podcast you're doing. Thank this you. Is what, this is how we do it, man. Like we, we contribute and just show up and, and give offerings to the best of our ability. So you have my utmost respect and support always here for you. Do anything I can do. Thanks. Man. Uh, I can support you, man. Do you, uh, do you have anything that you'd uh, like to like to plug? Nah, dude. Just, just take care of yourselves. I thank you for asking. Don't, I don't care about social media. I don't care about the new book. Like, <laughs> just, just take care of yourselves. You yeah, know, like just, just be fucking good to yourself and be good to other humans. Like that's it, man. So thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem, man. Hey, thanks again, brother. I really do appreciate it. All love my man.
Amen. Thanks.